Today is January 18th, 2016, and on today's show, we're going to cover two things. First, I have an interview with John Brillhart. He is the founder of Cable Alternatives, and he is a uh, cutting the cord expert. If you've wanted to get rid of cable but still enjoy the TV shows that you like to watch, hopefully John today will be able to provide some really good tips. I confess I've never been able to break free of cable. I know that sounds so pathetic. Uh, but it's true. But if you're uh, if you're one trying to uh, break free from the cord, uh, hopefully John can provide some good insight for you today. I have an interview with him. It's going to last about 15 minutes. Then uh, we're going to cover the stock market. You know, it's been down here in the start of 2016, really by by a fair amount. Uh, and uh, so today, what I want to cover after the interview with John is uh, how you can stick to your investment plan even when. Uh, the stock market is heading uh, lower. And, and and this is not going to be just some, you know, uh, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. Uh, I'm going to give you some practical tips, some things that I do uh, that help me uh, stay in the market, whether it's uh, going up or going down. If you're a first-time listener and wondering who in the world this person is behind the microphone, my name is Rob Berger. I'm the founder of net and the host of, of this podcast and uh, you can get connected in a number of different ways. We have a, a sort of a private secret Facebook group that's not really all that private or secret, but you can join it if you go to doorroller.net slash Facebook group. Uh, that will redirect you to the group there on Facebook. It's been a, a, a wonderful experience. It's surpassed my expectations. I'm very happy we started it. And uh, they've got about 250 or 300 members at the moment and a very active, great place to ask questions, great place to provide feedback to others. And then you can also join the weekly newsletter. It's free. It goes out every, every Saturday, includes links to a lot of, basically a lot of stuff on the internet that helps you uh, make the most of your money. Uh, that, you can sign up at doorroller.net slash newsletter. So with that, let's get right to the interview. And, and as I said, John is um, the founder of Cable Alternatives and a cord cutting expert. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. Well, I'm thrilled that you could take a few minutes. I know you've got your two young children with you, so this will might be, <laughs> and that's great. Uh, that the, uh, Mine are at the other end. They're in their 20s, but I, I certainly remember the days of uh, young kids at home while I was trying to work, so I appreciate you taking a few minutes um, to help us. So your expertise is helping people get rid of cable. How did you, Absolutely. How did you get into that kind of business? Well, um, you know, my, my entrepreneurship story is uh, kind of a, it's, it's a classic, fairly classic one. It's what a lot of people do. I, uh, I have an MBA. I was in the corporate world. I was, in a pro- I was a project manager for a Fortune 500 company, and I got laid off. And I, at 2012, in 2012, I became a stay-at-home dad. And, uh, you know, I did that for about a year and a half. And, uh, you know, I saw what was happening uh, in the industry. Just to give you a little bit of a personal background, I was, I've been a cord cutter since about 2009, and you know back then, uh, you know people were um, people kind of looked at me funny and wondered why I didn't have cable. That really changed in about 2014. They thought it was really interesting that I didn't have cable, and they wanted to know more. And so I started helping out family and friends, and I really realized that there could be a business uh, potential for this. And so I came up with the idea of cable, cable alternatives, and I pitched it to my wife, and she said, you know, that's a great idea. Um, just make sure you make money. And so, uh, uh, you know, we started Cable Alternatives in August of 2014. We've got some media coverage in this, this past spring, and we've been very busy ever since. So now Cable Alternatives, I noticed you sell products on that site as well as you do services. Mm-hmm. Do you actually go to folks' homes and help them set it up? Yeah, absolutely. We are the uh, sort of the white glove cord cutting consultant, if you will. I will go to people's homes and initially and consult with them, usually with a family around a dining room table, and we'll talk through their TV watching habits and kind of their needs and the shows that they like, and then we'll propose a solution, and usually they'll have us install it afterwards, and usually that involves an HD antenna and a DVR uh, and streaming device as well. Where is your company physically located? We're located in Fridley, Minnesota, which is just outside of Minneapolis. Okay. All right. And then, of course, you have, uh, for folks that don't live in that area, you sell products and folks can install it themselves. Uh, we generally will give out advice. Uh, we can sell the product, but generally we tell them to work through their local channels because the product support is a little bit better with the national outlets than it is with us across the country. Okay. Well, I kind of want to jump right to it because I've, I've toyed with getting rid of cable. I've thought a lot about it. Uh, my wife and I have had very um, animated discussions on this topic. 
Of course, and yeah. We, we always seem to run into sort of the same problem, so I kind of like to go down the problems. And, and, and of course. And you can help us solve them. The first one is getting your, your major networks, and I guess maybe with mm -hmm. an antenna. How does that work? Well, there's a couple options with an antenna. You can certainly try to purchase an antenna uh, at Best Buy or at Target or one of the major retailers. And uh, you know those antennas will get you the major television networks in your area, which generally are NBC, ABC, CBS, and Fox, as well as some of the independents in high definition and actually a better picture than you get with cable or satellite. Okay. And, and when you, do you, do you, would you recommend that folks install it themselves, pay someone to install it? Are they difficult to install? Well, the way, process you want to do uh, is generally just you know pick one at, at the retailers, and there's a multitude of different antennas that might do a different, uh, bunch of different things. But just pick one, save the receipt, try it out, uh, try it in different positions in your home, uh, and if that doesn't work, get another one. And just be a little patient uh, trying to find the right antenna. Ultimately, if you don't find something on the consumer side that works, uh, at that time, it's probably a good idea to call a professional. And Cable Alternatives does professional inst antenna installations in the Twin Cities, and they're generally around. They're not as numerous as they were back in the old days, but they are definitely around. You can find uh, people that will install professional antennas either in your roof or your attic for you. And, and so I'm obvious, I'm a neophyte here, so this may be sure. the dumbest question you've ever heard. But how do you connect, how do you connect the, t the antenna to the TV? Is it through the coax cable, or you have to wire your whole house? Absolutely. Absolutely. Generally, what we do when we install professionally is we hook it into the existing coax so where your cable signal was coming out in, in the little uh, wall outlet that you had before, right. it would be your antenna signal as well. And, okay, and, that makes sense. And there are, there are a lot of concerns about weather or uh, other uh, weather issues or anything else with TV antennas. That's one thing I wanted to spell. If your TV antenna is properly installed, it will not experience weather drops okay. like you would with satellite. Have you found that, that antennas in, a, in an attic do reasonably well, or do you find that most of the time you have to get one of those giant monstrosities that you put on top of your house? Well, you can certainly install the giant monstrosity in your attic and do just fine. Okay. It depends a little bit on your location uh, as to what will work in your area, and that's what a professional will certainly help you with. Okay. All right, so that's problem number one. Problem number two is sports, and for me, particularly football. How do I, mm -hmm. get, how do I watch NFL football? Um, I guess I could watch it on the networks when it's playing there with the antenna. Uh, Absolutely. What about things like ESPN and particularly college football when it's that you know they're, they're not always playing on the major networks. Well, ESPN is available on a service called Fling, and I don't know if you've heard of that. It's a fairly new service uh, that came out in February that does have ESPN on it. It's about twenty dollars a month, uh, and, and you can and what's certainly it called again Fling F Fling. S L I N G oh, Sling. sling. Okay. It's a little bit different than there's a product out there called Sling Box. Uh, people get people confuse Sling and Sling Box a little bit. It's a little bit of a different product. Sling is more like Netflix with TV channels, whereas Sling Box is this physical box. Okay. Is that my so so with the antenna? It's a one, obviously a one-time purchase, and then mm -hmm. I, I don't have any monthly fees. If I want ESPN, one option mm -hmm. is Sling, and but that's twenty Absolutely. bucks a month. Right? That's right. Uh, so I want to keep a running tally of what this might cost me on a monthly basis. So any other options mm -hmm. for ESPN or, or, for that matter, the NFL Network? Uh, NFL Network is pretty difficult to get, as well as most regional sports networks. So, uh, you, know, if there's a, you know, if you're watching your baseball team or your basketball team, that's a little bit harder to get. It's really if you're looking at football, college, and, um, uh, college and pro, that's kind of, you know, that, if you're a fan of only football, that's generally the best way to cut the court. So, so do you ever go out to a family, they want, they're, they're interested in this, sports is a big deal, and it ends up being a deal mm -hmm. breaker. You ultimately conclude, look, if sports is that important to you, you probably can't cut mm -hmm. the cord. Is that a right? Is that it, it's, it's a value question. So uh, most of my customers save about 100 bucks a year, which is, or 100 bucks a month, which is about $1,200 a year. And so it's a question of whether or not their sports is worth $1,200 a year to them. And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. Sure, sure. Okay. All right, problem three uh, is a DVR. Can, you know, most cable, with cable packages, they, you, you lease, you rent a DVR. Um, Absolutely. Can you get a DVR on your own that doesn't require you to pay a monthly service fee? Yes, you can. Okay. And uh, what does that look like? You can hook. Well, there's a couple DVRs. And so uh, the one that doesn't require a monthly service fee that we sell is called a Channel Master DVR Plus. 
and it's a pretty straightforward DVR that you can hook up to your antenna. It interfaces with some DVR, uh, some streaming services such as Vudu and Netflix. But if you're just looking for a basic DVR, if you're not a big DVR person, but you do want to record shows uh, occasionally, that's what I do recommend. The Channel Master the DV- DVR, the Channel Master DVR Plus. That's right. Got it. Um, the the other DVR in the market that's relatively popular and that we sell a tremendous amount of is the TiVo. And the TiVo, I'm sure you've heard of the the TiVo brand. It's a it's an award winning interface that we really like and we sell quite a bit of. Uh, it's got Netflix, uh, 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 Amazon, and Hulu integrated into it as well. So it's got the streaming services integrated into it, which makes it really simple. Right. Um, it does have a it does have a fee associated with it. The new TiVo bolts, which just came out this year or this past uh, two months ago, um, which are amazing by the way, uh, have about $150 a year uh, service fee attached to it, which comes out to about eleven twelve twelve dollars a month. Okay, all right. Um... I take it if you don't get the TiVo, if you want to go with something like mm-hmm. the Channel Master, is yep. that you still got to figure out, and we haven't gotten to streaming services. Well, why don't we just go to streaming services, and then we'll come back to the question mm-hmm. I was going to ask you. The big three, Netflix, yep. Hulu, and Amazon, do you need all three yep. of them? I mean, does it just depend on what you like to watch and what they offer? How do you figure that out? Here's how I, here's how I recommend, uh, you know, it, this gets a little bit more towards cutting the cord in general and one's approach. And... You know, a lot of people approach cutting the cord with, I'll, I'll move this back a little bit if you don't mind, Rob, just kind of in a broader question. Um, a lot of people sort of uh, think that when they cut the cord, um, you know, I have to watch my specific channel or I have to watch this or that or the other. Um, if you're approaching cutting the cord that way, it's going to be a little bit difficult. However, uh, if you take a step back and say, you know what, I'm open to watching different things that might entertain me, that's a good way to cut the cord. And there's generally three things that I do recommend when you're cutting the cord. Uh, number one, always get an HD antenna like we talked about, and make sure you're able to tune in good reception. And there's, like we talked about, there are several different ways to do it. Uh, number two, uh, what I recommend is um, looking at devices that you already have, such as your DVD player, uh, where you can you know, replace your content that you have, uh, with a service like Redbox, which is really cheap and really easy to understand and use. And that gets you a lot of first-run movies that a lot of people do enjoy in their on-demand services or maybe are looking to re- watch instead of, um, you know, some of their cable channels. Number three, look, start to look at the streaming services. And this is where it gets a little complicated But um, it, when you're trying to look at it initially, but... Uh, you want to take a simple approach to it. So after you do the first two things and you find that you find that you want to uh, do more, just take a real simple approach to it. Get a streaming device such as a Roku, or if you have a DVR, use your TiVo, um, and subscribe to one service. Usually, I recommend that service to be Netflix, but you can pick and start to start to really um, be open to the content you watch, but be real serious about wa- watching that service. So. You know, for not watching these cable channels anymore, watch what's find out what's on Netflix, and you know, look into it and see what's there. Find, be open to finding new things that will entertain you. Um, usually, you will find something that's good for you and that will take up your time. I'll offer you an example. So, I had a customer. Uh, one of my very first customers had, uh, you know, had a had a whole slew of shows that she wanted to maintain watching after she cut the cord. And we developed a process whereby she could do that. She can buy some of these shows. She can buy some of those shows online. My apologies. That's my okay. Old has brings back lots uh, of ideas. For me. Yeah, uh, she can buy some of those shows online. She could do a whole slew of different kind of complicated things to do it. And I showed her all. Of it. However, once once we actually got her to cut the cord, and she subscribed to uh, Netflix, she found out that a lot of the content on Netflix really took up a lot of her time. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, you know, I said, hey, are you, are you going to watch, um, did, you buy, uh, uh, did you buy Sherlock online at Amazon? And she says, no, you know what, I found Orange is the New Black, New Black, no, Orange is the New Black on Netflix, and I'm watching that now. And that's really the approach that you want to take as a cord cutter, is be open to what's new on a streaming service, and from there, uh, let those habits, uh, uh, allow your habits to change a little bit, and you will be pretty satisfied. Um, what was I going to say here? The hardest thing about cutting the cord, honestly, Rob, is crossing that threshold. Once you cross that threshold, 
you find that your habits adjust very, very easily, much more, much more easily than you thought. Right. And I take it the, sort of the, take it the fifth, fifth problem is the Internet. You still need high-speed Internet. Mm -hmm. And yep. at least with Fios, I mean, there are times when they tell me, you know, your price will actually be lower if you keep cable. Um, well, <laughs> you know, who would have thunk it your cable company is lying to you? Um, <laughs> you know, generally, here's, here's how that works, and, and it's, it's a bit complex to understand, but, but more, here's what they're doing. Um, they're generally not offering you a promotional discount for Internet, but they are offering you a promotional discount for, for television. So, you know, basically, yes, uh, in some cases there's a better value proposition initially to buy TV and, it, TV and Internet rather than Internet alone. However, uh, usually for most companies, they'll offer you a promotional discount for Internet only after a period of time. Uh, so if you buy internet only from your fi from files or whomever, usually you can wait about three months and then call them back and say, you know what, I've got internet only. I want to negotiate a pro promotional discount, and they'll generally give it to you. The other approach that you can take, uh, Rob, is to look at other providers other than your current incumbent provider, and that's where uh, you have the most advantage because you uh, you qualify for the new subscriber discounts. So. Uh, Verizon's uh, file service. I'm assuming where are you located, Rob? In Northern Virginia. In Northern Virginia, um, I'm not quite sure the the, the incumbent uh, cable provider there. It's Cox. Uh, but you can cert okay. Well, you can certainly instead of Fios, you can call up Cox and say, uh, you know, uh, Cox, I want your internet only price. And usually that'll be around between forty and sixty dollars a month, depending on where you're at. Um, and that'll be a promotional discount. And that usually, when you're taking that kind of a view, usually that will be a lot cheaper than what you have right now. When you're looking at Internet, Internet, so it's a lot easier to switch Internet than it is uh, television providers. It's because it's just bits flowing over a pipe. So always look at all your Internet providers when you're looking at cutting the cord, not just the one you're getting your television service from. Well, that's good advice. Okay. Well, hey, I appreciate your time. I know your hands are full with your two young children. Let me ask you just one last question, and that is... Of course. What's your setup at home? What, what equipment do you use? What do you stream? How does it work at your house? Well, I've got an HD antenna uh, installed in my attic, and, of course, I did that myself because I know how to install antennas. Um, I've got a DVD player that I use actually fairly, uh, uh, fairly often with uh, red boxes just down the street. I actually just returned a couple of DVDs today. And I've also got a TiVo. Uh, which has, uh, you know, I, we do DVR quite a bit on network television, uh, and then we use uh, watch some of the streaming services that are integrated into the TiVo as well. Okay. Well, great. Well, hey, I appreciate your time. So people can find you at cablealternatives.com. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. That's right. Well, great. Well, I appreciate uh, your, your wisdom in this area, an area that I confess has stumped me for, for a while, so I appreciate you <laughs> okay. today. Well, hey, uh, you know, I'm happy to help, uh, help, help your listeners uh, sort everything out. Please uh, take a look at my website. Even if you're not located in the Twin Cities, feel free to reach out to me, and I'm happy to hand out advice via email or phone. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rob. Well, thanks again to John for taking the time out to um, uh, talk with us today. If you have any questions, obviously you can reach out to him directly at cablealternatives.com. And as always, feel free to shoot me an email, drdorler.net. So now I want to switch gears really completely and go to the stock market. Uh, it's been down, as, as you no doubt know, uh, at the start of 2016. And, you know, if you, if you spend any time reading the financial news, you think it's, you know, we're going to enter the next financial Armageddon. I mean, you know, the, I think the, the headlines and the pictures that they use, you know, if you ever notice when the market's down uh, significantly on a, in, uh, one day, uh, the big uh, news media sites, if you go to their sites and they've, they've written an article about, uh, about the, the, the stock market that day, it's amazing the photos they have. They must just have these stock images of these stock traders on Wall Street. They're, they always have their head in their hand or this look on their face, their face like, you know, the world as they know it is coming to an end. And they stick that really, you know, painful looking photo in this article. And they always have a headline that just really grabs your attention that makes you think, uh, you know, our financial system, as we know it, is coming to an end. And I always, you know, uh, I kind of laugh at it, but it always troubles me because I think, you know, there, could, there are probably people out there that are taking this seriously. And uh, it's just, you know, you have to understand that their job is not to provide good, sound 
investment advice. Their job is to sell newspapers and magazines and to get a lot of viewers for their website. That's their job. And they do that with those sort of attention-grabbing headlines and those photos of, of the stock traders, uh, you know, practically collapsing physically on the, on the, on the floor there as, as the stock market goes down by 2% or 3%. Anyway, so I want to kind of address that today and walk through what I do and, and things that I think can help you uh, stick to your investment plan, regardless of, of whether the stock market is down significantly. Now, some of the things I'm going to suggest, you know, you can do right now. Others may take some time, and you'll see what I mean as we go through them. One of the things that brought this to my attention, in, in addition to the stock market uh, going down at the start of this year, is that I'm putting together a binder for my family. Uh, I call it my I just got hit by a truck binder. If, I, if something were to happen to me, uh, I want my family to understand our investments and our finances. And, and I think so many couples, uh, are there's one person in charge of the finances, and then the other person has no interest in it. I mean, I think that's a pretty common scenario. So in our family, obviously, I'm the one that, that handles all our finances, our investments, pays the bills, everything. My wife just has no interest in it. And it worries me. I mean, not that I, you know, lie awake every night worrying about this, but, you know, it's, it's on my mind. What if something were to happen to me? Would my wife know what to do? And what if, God forbid, something happened to both of us? You know, what, what would our children do? So I've uh, put together, I'm almost done with it, a binder. Um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a playbook, if you will. It's, someone can crack it open and understand our finances. And uh, I'm actually going to talk about this binder in some detail in a, in a future episode, in fact, very soon, because I think it's something that really every family should have. But as part of this binder, I have sort of uh, instructions or, you know, it's, I have instructions or suggestions, a- including how my wife, uh, or if we were to both go, my, our children should invest the money th- that we have. And it gets a little tricky for us because, you know, we have money in different retirement accounts, so they're going to have to deal with that. Uh, I, in our taxable account, I invest in um, individual stocks, which I'm going to guess my wife and children will have no interest in, in continuing to do, which will be fine. But one of the things I wrote, I'm just going to read you a, a couple of paragraphs I wrote in, 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 um, in a document that I've included in this binder. Again, I'm going to talk about the binder in more detail uh, here soon in a future episode. I think it's something everyone should have. But let me just read you what I wrote, because, you know, as I, I, I made some suggestions as to how they should invest the money. But I knew that no matter what I told them, you know, passive, low-cost, Vanguard funds, whatever, hire someone, don't hire someone, whatever the specifics are, they're still going to have to deal with their own emotions. Right now, I, do, I deal with that for my family. Right? My wife doesn't follow the stock market. She, she probably doesn't know that it's been down at the start of 2016, and there's no reason for her to know. Uh, but if she, she's handling it, um, she will need to know that and, and probably will be a little more aware of it. How is she going to handle things then if she's the one um, managing the investment? So here's what I wrote. I said, one final thought. Regardless of how you decide to handle our investments, remember one very important thing. A time will come when the market is crashing and you'll be tempted to sell everything and move to cash. These times usually involve a lot more than just a falling stock market. We may be at war unemployment and inflation may be sky high, or the banking system may be on the verge of collapse. Dark skies ahead. Don't sell. And I had exclamation point. I rarely use an exclamation point. I did this time. Don't sell. Think about all the bad stuff we've gone through in the past. World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, 9-11, the Great Recession, etc. The economy and the markets move in cycles. The best investors know this and never panic during bad times. Just stay the course. One thing that will help you stay the course is a simple rule. Never invest money in the stock market that you'll need in the next five years. This will help you sleep at night when the market is in turmoil. So as I was writing this, by the way, I was thinking, you know, the only time someone's going to need this notebook is when I get hit by a truck. And I wonder what they're going to be thinking after I'm gone as they read all of this. I'm not sure, but hopefully, hopefully it will help them. And, uh, and so I thought, well, let's, I'm going to share some of more details uh, for you today about how you can weather a crashing stock market. Now, one thing I want to say is that it's very different between someone who is, you know, in their 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s, uh, who are, you know, you're still working, you're still contributing, 
say, for retirement down the road, you're not spending any of your investments. You've got that, that person you know, you're in your working years. So imagine that group of people. Then you have a second group of people that are in retirement. They're living off of their investments. Those two groups of, of, of individuals, you're going to fall in one or the other, um, are very different when it comes to handling a stock market crash. It's much easier to handle it when you know you've got many years before retirement. Uh, you're continuing to contribute to your investments. So you, you get this benefit from a lower stock market because, you know, the money you contribute, say, each month in your 401k or IRA is buying more and more shares because the stock prices are down. Um, you know, that kind of person versus someone living off of their investments, not only is the total value of their investments going down, but they're taking money out. Now, it's like a, a double whammy. Uh, the stock market value is going down and you continue to withdraw money. Uh, that can be a really, you know, difficult thing to stomach. And, uh, and so, you know, you, I guess the point is there are, you know, two very different groups of people. But I think how you handle a stock market decline and the things that you can do uh, to avoid making a bad decision are pretty much the same, even though, again, people are, can be in very, very different circumstances. I think the things that we should do, by and large, are the same. So I want to I want to walk through them. I've got about, uh, let's see, I'm looking at my list. I've got six things, six things I want to cover. So number one is, um, you've got to be a stock market historian. Now, this doesn't mean, you know, you need to crack open a thousand page book and, and read it cover to cover. But it's important, and this was something I tried to convey in in the binder to my family that I just read you. Um, it's important to understand that the stock market moves in cycles. The economy moves in cycles. We go through good times and we go through bad times. And 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 in the bad times, the stock market goes down and it goes down significantly. We we all experienced that in 2008 and 2009. Uh, lost half its value. We experienced it in the tech bubble when it burst in um, 2000. You know, if you go all the way back to 1987, big stock market crash in one day. I mean, you could go back to the great, the start of the Great Depression and the stock market crash in 1929. Uh, These things happen, and we work through painful times, and then we recover. And uh, you know, that's just the way you know the the economy works. It's just the way business works. And so, I think if, the more we understand that, the less we are alarmed when we're in a down market. They're, they're never any fun. No one likes unemployment at 10%. Um, no one likes when business is struggling and they're not hiring and the, the, the stock market is down. But if we have some appreciation of, of, of our history, we know that it's temporary. Now, it may not seem temporary at the, t- temporary at the time when we're living through it, uh, but we know when we take a, a bigger picture view that it is temporary and that economy goes uh, in cycles. And so again, you know, you don't have to go to the library and buy some history book to understand this. Uh, maybe you just accept what I just said and, and, and you know enough. But, you know, if you follow the stock market, you see that it moves in cycles. And um, that's really, you know, a key, I think, a critical thing, uh, a critical tool to have to weather the storms. Uh, you know, that's when I look at 2016 and we've been down some you know, yeah, it's been much worse. These things happen. We've been up the last five years or so. I guess last year was more or less flat. But, um, you know, this is just, it's not unusual. It's not abnormal. This is just what the stock market does. Now, the second thing, and it's very, very much related, and I kind of alluded to this in what I read you from the binder that I prepared for my family, is that when the stock, stock market is really down, like it's, a, you know, 2008, 2009 kind of time frame, really bad. There are always a lot of other scary things going on. Back then, you know, unemployment was high. Um, the uh, banking industry was on the verge of collapse. It wasn't just uh, uh, a stock market in decline. It wasn't just a bear market. It was other things. And when we look back at really bad markets, we see that. It's not an unusual for a number of things to occur at the same time that really put pressure on business and the economy and everything else. Again, it could, it could be... Uh, a war, uh, it, you know, it could be something like 9/11. You know, in in 2008, it was just a a, a possible collapse of the, the 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 banking system. Remember, the auto industry was in turmoil, and and so um, the the reason I mention that, and the reason I think it's important to appreciate that, is that when the market is really really bad, you're going to be there's going to it's going to seem like it's coming at you from all directions, and if you recognize that even in those situations, as bad as they are. 
It's what happens, and we will eventually recover, and we just need to stay the course. So it's kind of similar to being an historian, but it's a slightly different spin on it. Uh, and, and, you know, because some people just say, well, if the market's down 40%, I can handle it, I can't handle it. But the market is never just down 40%. When the market's down 40%, a lot of other things are going wrong. And we need to expect that. That's what's going to happen. It's going to happen again in the future. Don't know when. We don't know the specific circumstances or what it will be. But we can count on it happening. And if, we're, if we set our expectations accordingly, we're far less likely to make big mistakes with our investments uh, when they happen. Okay. Number three, we need to diversify. We need to diversify in, I think, two important ways. The first is between our stock and bond allocation. We've talked about this many times. Some folks, you know, have 100% in stocks. Uh, a lot of younger folks, many years before to retirement. And if that's your choice, that's fine. I don't necessarily think it's a bad one. Uh, but, you know, if you've not lived through a 40% decline, I wouldn't assume, they, you know, you, you may think you can live through it just fine and stick to your investment plan. But then again, maybe not. Now, if you, maybe you were at 100% stocks in 08 and 09, you didn't sell a thing. You know, you've got that experience under your belt. You know you're going to stick with it. Fine. But for most people, I think an asset allocation uh, between stocks and bonds is, is important. The bond portfolio long term isn't going to earn as much as a stock portfolio, but it's going to add a little bit of stability uh, to your overall return. And, uh, you know, there, there's no one right allocation for me. We're generally at 80% stocks, 20% bonds, and I'm 49. Um, I certainly think 90-10 would be fine. I could, you know, probably 70-30 as well. It's as much art as it is science. But I think uh, some level of bonds, whatever you're comfortable with, uh, to give your, your portfolio a little bit of stability can help you weather the, the storms. Now, keep in mind, though, you know, just because you're, let's say, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, you know, your portfolio as a whole can still go down substantially in a bear market. So, you know, it's not as uh, an, an allocation of bonds is not going to, you know, um, keep you from paper losses in a bear market. It just won't. You'll still lose and could lose significantly. And I say lose your portfolio could go down significantly, uh, but it won't go down as much in a bear market as someone who's got 100% stocks or 90% stocks and 10% bonds. So some diverse, diversity there, diversification can help you weather the storms. The other thing is uh, I think it's important to diversify outside of stocks and bonds. Now, for many of us, it just means our home. Uh, not that I consider it an investment. For most of us, it's not an income-producing investment, but it is one that, uh, an asset that appreciates, usually by the rate of inflation long-term. Uh, but that's one way to di diversify your net worth. For other folks, you know, you might own real estate, you might own a business. Um, and again, that won't work for everyone. But to the extent that you can diversify even beyond just stocks and bonds, I think it's a very good thing uh, uh, to do. Again, it won't apply to everyone, but for those that it does, uh, I think that can help weather uh, the storm of, of a falling stock market. So however you diversify, diversification is important. Uh, it keeps us and helps us stick to our investment plan. That's the third thing. The, the, the fourth thing is the five-year rule. Uh, and that is, you know, I don't ever want to put money in the stock market that I think I'm going to need over the next five years. Now, I'll be the first to admit five years is, is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, you've got to pick a number. The reason I picked five years is because I think that will cover most uh, bear market cycles, not necessarily all of them. We could be down for more than five years. That's certainly possible. Uh, but I think by and large, it will cover most uh, of the bear cycles. And, you know, you, for you, you might say seven years could be different. But uh, you, you don't want to put money, the point is you don't want to put money in the stock market that you're going to need in the next couple of years. You know, a lot of folks email me and say, I've got, I've got $100,000 and I'm saving for a house, but boy, I hate the interest rates on a savings account. What do you think about putting it in Betterment or Wealthfront or Vanguard with some sort of stock bond allocation? And my answer is always, well, it's not a good idea, not if you're going to need it in two years or whatever, because you could very well be down, even in a 50-50 allocation between stocks and bonds. Uh, it could be down. Now, you know, if you've got flexibility and if it goes down, you know, maybe you won't buy a home for five or six years and that's okay with you, then maybe. But if you're going to need your money over the next couple of years, it shouldn't be in the stock market. You want that liquidity. Uh, you just can't expose yourself uh, to that risk that it's going to go down. The, the, the idea of, 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 and this is true even with 
but with bonds, anything other than short-term bonds, but certainly true with equities. I only want to sell when it's advantageous for me to sell. And so I don't want to put money in the stock market that I may be forced to sell, say, two or three years from now, when it could be a very bad time uh, for me to sell. If I have complete control over when I sell, then I'm not worried about a down market. A down market just may be a buying opportunity as long as I have control over when, when I sell. And the way I look at it is the, the five-year the five year rule. I think, by the way, that applies very much in retirement, right? I don't want to be selling stocks uh, in the same year I need the money, right? I should have the money I need over the next few years in cash, possibly short-term uh, certificates of deposit, possibly short-term bonds. But I don't want to have to go sell my S&P 500 index fund shares just to get by this year, right? I need that cushion and if the, you know, so that I can, I can sell when it's advantageous to me, not when I need to go to the grocery store. If, if, so, so again, I, I use the five-year rule. Your mileage may, may vary. It's not set in stone, but you, you certainly want enough time uh, to give you the flexibility uh, to sell when it's advantageous to you, not to be forced to sell uh, for living expenses when perhaps the market uh, is, is down. And then the fifth one, it's kind of an offshoot to this. I call it the, the one-year rule. Uh, again, a bit arbitrary, but it's what works for me. And that's that um, within that five-year rule, I, I want a year, at least a year's worth of expenses in cash. You know, not short-term bonds. You could use short-term bonds. I keep mine in an FDIC-insured online savings account. Um, but I want one year's worth of expenses in a savings account. Yes, it hurts that a savings account only only pays about 1% right now. Uh, that's relatively temporary. I'm not quite sure when it's going to go up. I wish sooner rather than later, but whatever. Uh, but I just want that liquidity in my life, uh, you know, and the ability to tap that liquidity if I sh should need it. And again, it keeps me from making bad decisions with my investments. When I'm invested, I, I, for example, I, I own shares of Apple. If you followed Apple, you know uh, that their stock has been down. But I'm not worried about it. I'm not forced to sell. And I still think it's a great company, uh, great balance sheet, great brand, great products. Uh, and so I can weather the, weather the storm of a falling share price for Apple stock, and I'm not worried about it. If I had no money in the bank, and I, you know, then you know it could be it, it it could be you know a little more a little more difficult. As part of this, you know, talking about the one year rule, the five year rule, one of the things that that applies to both of those has to do with debt. Uh, the lower the debt, the better, of course. That's, you know, makes sense just from a, you know, general personal finance money management perspective. But it also applies to the ability to stick to an investment plan. When you're maxed out on your credit cards, have a mortgage you can't really afford, school loans, um, all this sort of thing, it makes sticking to an investment plan all the more difficult. Now, I know if that's your situation today, you can't simply snap your fingers and change it overnight. It may take you months, years. Uh, it could take a long time uh, to get pay the, pay a lot of your debt down and to get into a more stable financial situation. But it should be a goal uh, uh, for everybody. And as you pay that debt down, a couple of things happen. One is, you know, you you need less money to cover your 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 expenses for one year. If you have no debt, um, you know, you don't have those those debt payments to make. So your your monthly expenses, what you need to live month to month, are of course a lot less. And that's our case. We have a mortgage, but that's it. We don't have car loans, credit card debt, school loans. So, you know, the amount we need uh, to put in a savings account to cover one year of expenses is a lot less than someone in a similar situation, but with a lot of debt, right? And um, uh, the same thing is true with the five-year rule. Again, if, if you've got to cover a lot of debt over the next five years, that's all the more money you're going to need in cash. So, um, if you can keep your debt as low as possible, I think it makes it, it increases our 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 ability to withstand um, market declines because we're not fearful of of perhaps defaulting on all of these these loans. Again, I recognize you can't just snap your fingers and get rid of your debt. Uh, it's a process. I get that, but I think a lot of people don't don't um, correlate the the debt they have with their investment plan, and I think they're much more connected than many people think. Um, those with a lot l less in debt are, 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 I think, all other things being equal, have a greater ability to stick to their investment plan. All right, the sixth and final thing is don't look, and I mean this in all seriousness. When the market's down, if, you, if you're worried about it, 
just don't look. Don't go look at your investments. Don't open up, you know, your Vanguard account or or your Wealthfront account, or if you maybe if you use personal capital to track investments or a spreadsheet. Don't look at it. Uh, it may sound silly and gimmicky, and in some ways, I guess it is, but it can also work. And in fact, you know, not that I'm tempted to sell, but when the market's down, I often don't look. Um, you know, what, what what's the point? What what, how is that information going to help me make a decision? Now, maybe you do look because you're thinking about rebalancing or you do look because you're thinking about buying, you know, a stock that's been down. That's fine, of course. Uh, but if you're worried about, you know, sticking to your investment plan and you see that the stock market's down, just don't open up your statement. Don't look. Um, I think that's a perfectly valid approach. And in fact, you know, I talked to a number of people that have 401ks and I asked them, so what are you invested in? What, what are you, how's it doing? What, you know, what do you think? And they're like, you know, I don't even know. I don't even look. You know, money goes in. I haven't looked in years. Now, I'm not suggesting that is, a, is, a, is the best approach to your investments. If nothing else, you should be looking to rebalance your portfolio at least once a year. But from a sticking to your investment plan, it, it works wonders. So if, 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 if you're worried and, and, and you're concerned you're going to abandon your investment plan because the stock market's down 2, 3, 5, 10%, then just don't look. And um, that might keep you from making a very bad uh, very bad and costly mistake. I will tell you that a lot of people have emailed me. And I've talked to folks who, who, who in 08 and 09 sold all their investments and they profoundly regret the decision. I've had people tell me, Rob, I wish I would have talked to you first. And uh, so don't make those mistakes. And if you've made those mistakes in the past, that's fine. Just learn from them and don't make them again. I will not pretend uh, that all of this is easy. Um, I think over time it gets easier. Uh, but uh, particularly for new investors or for those nearing retirement, it, it, can get, it can get very painful emotionally. I understand that. Uh, but the key is to have a sound investment plan to begin with and then to stick to it no matter what the market is doing. Hope those tips helped you. And, uh, you know, if you have other ideas on this, feel free to shoot me an email, dr.doriller.net, or better yet, join the Facebook group, doriller.net slash Facebook group. We would love to. Uh, to have you join the group and participate. It's a wonderful uh, group of people. Well, there you go. I uh, hope you weather this, this, I'll call it a mini stock market decline. It's not, frankly, as history goes, not all that bad, but it may have some of you worrying. So I hope you weather the storm uh, well and stick to your investment plan. Uh, as I mentioned, I will be talking about this binder I put together for my family so that perhaps you can put one together for your family as well. That's going to be coming up. Uh, soon. So I'll have that for you. Until then, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.